Cool bananas. Alrighty. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the party and thanks for joining. As you can see, I'm sporting a quite fine mustache that I'm very proud of. Uh, so tonight we are doing buffaloes. Okay, cool. So we are talking about, we did a whole comprehensive workshop last year on bovine ecology and the species of buffalo and uh, cattle around the world. But tonight we are doing um, more the conservation side and the, the cultural and environmental impact of buffaloes in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're only focusing on what's considered to be the African buffalo or the Cape buffalo. Uh, because this is a workshop, uh, more than just an actual lecture, we can ask questions. You guys can interrupt me whenever you want. I've managed to figure out the problem, so we've got a full 45 minutes of talking to go ahead of us. And yeah, we're just going to have some fun tonight and hopefully learn some stuff. And um, yeah, cool. So it's a fairly small group, only 10 of us, nine, 10 of us. And um, yeah, so there is um, only one species of buffalo in Africa, but there are four subspecies, the smallest being the forest buffalo. There's also the West African buffalo, the Central African buffalo, and probably the most... Um, um, dispersed in terms of population, the Southern African buffalo or the Cape buffalo, as we call it. And um, <clears throat> the forest buffalo is actually quite different. It's quite ruddy brown in color, whereas the other buffaloes are all very similar. And they range anything between 600 to 900 kilograms. Rumors of a ton have been said out there, but I think a lot of the time people just tend to um, you know, buff up the numbers to make sure that these animals sound bigger than they actually are. But um, What's actually frightening about buffalo conservation is that people don't realize that the animal is listed as threatened. And um, estimates of buffalo populations put their numbers at anything between 400,000 to 900,000. And that sounds like a lot, but bear in mind 400,000 at its lowest estimate is lower than the number of African elephants in Africa. So they're saying that there's potentially fewer buffaloes in Africa than elephants. And if you consider the biomass, as in the actual weight of buffaloes versus the weight of elephants, even at 900,000 buffaloes, it doesn't come to the close to the same biomass as the elephants. So buffaloes are in a worse predicament than elephants. And part of the problem is, and I harp on this all the time, is the hunting industry. That's really, it's the only real threat to buffaloes is unfettered and uncontrolled um, Trophy, the trophy hunting industry, we guys blast at hundreds of these buffaloes at a time. And because they are not nearly as considered to be as charismatic or as interesting as any of the other big five, they don't get nearly the same sort of protection or sort of reverence that any of the other big five get. And because of that, their numbers have been decimated far worse than people actually realize, just like the giraffe. The giraffe is in far worse a predicament than people realize. It's, and people think giraffe are common, they're considered to be endangered. And buffalo are considered to be threatened with a declining population across Africa. There's nowhere in Africa except for some of the big national parks where buffalo populations are increasing. Um, now, historically, buffaloes have actually increased in number in certain areas um, due to uh, the, the outbreak of rinderpest in the turn of the century. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, rinderpest wiped out over 95% of buffalo populations across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Rinderpest was a disease brought over from brought over from uh, from the the, um, the Middle East by it, the Italian army in the late 1800s, along with their cattle. Their cattle built up a partial immunity to it, and unfortunately, it got into the 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 populations of buffaloes and other ruminants. Remember, ruminants are animals with a four-chambered stomach and a cloven hoof. So that's giraffe, antelope, any of those guys, and it's just spread its way through the ruminant population of sub-Saharan Africa and wiped out up to 95% of populations. So buffaloes were only in a few thousand. I mean, estimates, they, they were, there's a, a, I read in a book about rinderpest, they said that there was only 50 buffalo left in South Africa. I don't know if that's true or not. I've gone by that number in the past. There may be more than that, but um, the, the, the numbers have increased since the 1800s to the 1900s. But however, um, the fact remains is that in general, since um, although there has been this growth at the beginning of the century, their numbers are starting to decrease again because we're not actually protecting their populations. 
And um, one of the big problems with buffaloes, as I said, the fact is they're not romanticized to nearly the same extent as any of the other big five. They're just considered to be a large cow. In fact, it's only when you're on foot do people tend to give buffalo any sort of reverence. People don't really stop for them at, at game parks. I mean, last year I took out these Canadian high schoolers, uh, their first time in Africa, and we did an environmental and apartheid tour of South Africa. So we covered apartheid, the history, went to Robben Island, blah, 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 you know, Johannesburg, the whole two. And then we did quite an extensive amount of time in the Kruger National as well. And these kids had never seen a buffalo before. And they just looked at it, nodded their head, moved on. You know, they'd be like, oh, it's a cow. <laughs> so um, we don't seem to have the same sort of reverence for buffalo as we do for any of the other big five. And I'm sure you guys know, but for those of you that don't know, the big five comes from a trophy hunting term. It's not because of um, any conservation purpose or any sort of cultural impact. It's the five most dangerous animals to hunt in Africa. And that's where it came from. Not from um, you know, the, the five most interesting or the five largest or what have you. Um, so, I mean, I've heard people you know, accidentally confuse the giraffe on the big five in the past, which I say, no, it's obviously not. But the buffalo is on there purely by virtue of the fact that it's an extremely dangerous animal because of its aggression, but it's not given any sort of reverence. And I think that's been one of the challenges in conservation of buffalo is the fact that it's not revered. It's just seen as a, a cow, a cow with a bad attitude. Um, before I go on, are there any questions or any statements? People want to share anything? Um, maybe just things you want me to cover this evening? Yay, nay? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um... Can you explain the social structure of an African buffalo? I heard you actually named the uh, owl is a bit difficult. Okay, so buffaloes. Okay, um, so buffaloes are typically, in terms of the large herd structure, it's a matriarchy, but not of one female. It's several dominant females that kind of cooperate and they have, for want of another word, a form of democracy where they all kind of lean in one direction and they all kind of go in that way. Uh, Frankie, we'll get to buffalo disease in a minute, apart from hunting, but yes, disease is a major factor. Sorry, I've got a cat harassing me. She's very sweet. Um, and, but yeah, diseases are a major factor. So there are social hierarchy of females. Lily Bell's coming to say hello. Say hello, Lily Bell. <coughs> say hello. <coughs> exactly. All right. Um, <laughs> That's Lily Bell. She's very sweet. And um, so buffaloes are a matriarchy, but not of a dominant female like elephants. They are, a, it's, a, it's a group of dominant females that work together in their own way. But they do have subherds of males that are usually between the ages of two to seven years old, two to five years old, give or take. They form little small buddy groups. So they're small herds of maybe four or five young males. Then they tend to rejoin the herd for a couple of years. And then after about 10 or 12 years, they move off in twos, threes, or solitary individuals. And they are what we call as dugger boys, you know, those big hulking heavy brutes that hang out in the long grass and the reeds. And those are the ones that end up uh, killing people because they're very aggressive. Um, so that's really the social structure. Um, it's And what happens is the herds grow and grow and grow and grow. And eventually, they start to fragment and separate into new herds. Um, there's no real you know, matriarch that decides to lead the herd. They just end up breaking into certain groups. You know, a daughter will end up having a whole bunch of calves with her you know, sisters along the side, and they'll end up forming their own little matriarchies and shift off into their own little um, habitats. So you know, that's basically how buffalo grow and uh, spread around. They, the herd grows to a certain size, starts to fracture, and they start moving off in different groups because the herd dynamic doesn't work anymore. Any other questions? No. Okay, yeah. So disease is a huge problem. Rinderpest has thankfully been stamped out as of 2010. And that is, and I know people don't like this word, that's because of vaccines. Yes, vaccines have wiped out rinderpest worldwide. It's a virus. The word rinderpest literally means cattle disease. And uh, as again, it, it's 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 been around for well over 3,000 years. I mean, they've had documented cases of rinderpest dating back to 600 BC. And um, we actually think that rinderpest is the, the, the ancestor of uh, the generic measles that humans get. And we think that um, it was a zoonotic disease that actually jumped from cattle populations to human populations around 3,000 years ago, or 2,500 years ago. And um, 
So, but we've managed to, by vaccinating cattle populations around the world and wildlife populations where we can, we, for the most, for pretty much as far as people can tell, we've managed to wipe out rinderpest. The, the rinderpest vaccine has been very effective and there hasn't been a single recorded case of rinderpest in the world in over 11 years. So it's an extinct disease. Yay vaccines, go get your damn vaccine. And I don't care if it offends anybody. Um, anyway, so um, on that note, but yeah, so we do have other diseases. Cattle TB is a major problem amongst uh, buffalo because pretty much any disease that common household cattle can get, I know, not common household, but common cattle can get, you, your buffalo can get. They're very closely related and the disease is interchangeable. So you can get foot and mouth disease, you can get dis distemper or what they call corridor disease, East Coast disease, uh, which is, comes from um, also from domestic livestock and by far one of the most common diseases um, just let me know, guys, if you can't hear me, because it's saying the signal is unstable. Um, one of the most common diseases, of course, is bovine TB. And bovine TB is so prevalent amongst cattle populations, sorry, amongst um, buffalo populations, they don't actually allow buffalo to move around. They don't transport buffalo from one reserve to another reserve. It's really a hard time convincing people to actually uh, getting permits to move buffalo. Because... Um, they are trying really hard to stop the spread of bovine TB in populations. And so when they find an area where a population has not, got, has not been infected, they will do everything in their power to make sure that no new buffalo that potentially carry the disease are into, um, introduced to that area. So it makes mixing up of genes very, very difficult. And we're starting to get this Alabama situation occurring with buffalo where these gene pools are so badly inbred in these reserves and they never disperse, probably even more so than elephants. They're very slow breeding animals. They only breed once or twice, uh, once every year or every second year. They only start breeding about four or five years old. And they might only have four or five calves in their lifetime, maybe six on a good day. So they tend to have 34 families. And because of that, inbreeding is a problem. And because we're not moving around bovine populations, or sorry, buffalo populations, they are guess on to have really poor genetic gene pools. And you're starting to see, especially in South Africa, if you ever go to these reserves in South Africa, you look at the size of our buffaloes and they are quite frankly pathetic. When you head up to Zimbabwe, to some of those really big reserves, you head up to Northern Mozambique and you start getting to Kenya and those areas, then you get to get some absolute beasts. Uh, because of the reserves there, they have fewer private reserves, which of course is one of its own problems, but because there's fewer private reserves, there's only large reserves. And a lot of those buffalo are allowed to move freely in those areas, and they tend to have healthier gene pools, and they tend to be bigger, even with the diseases. A lot of the times, they are carriers of diseases, like foot and mouth and bovine TB. But buffalo tend to, under good conditions with low stress, not really be affected by too much, unlike cattle, which get hit hard. Um, it's a very similar situation to, to wildebeest because wildebeest carry diseases that cattle get really, really easily, like uh, hot water. But uh, we're not talking about wildebeest today. Anyway, so yeah, buffalo populations are decreasing across Africa, and um, they actually have a very important ecological role. What they've discovered is that areas that have low numbers of bu uh, buffalo are not actually being overgrazed, they're being undergrazed in wilderness areas. And these areas are actually turning into, into bush, into thorn bush thickets. And in many areas, that actually is ideal breeding grounds for tsetse flies, which of course spreads sleeping sickness. So these thorny thickets, they are breeding grounds for tsetse flies in sub-Saharan Africa. And these, these flies spread their diseases into, into rural areas and these sleeping sicknesses infect people and cattle. So the decrease in buffalo has actually had an effect on human populations as well. So because in the past, buffalo, by just walking through these huge herds of 150 to 350, like we used to get in the past, not 20 or 30, like you see in some game reserves, those huge, massive herds would just trample through a field, destroying every seedling, destroying all the seed banks, smashing up the landscape, making it ideal for grasses. And they would actually may help maintain grasslands, which would help inhibit tsetse fly populations. But what we've seen in recent years is an undergrazing in many areas. I know it's weird to say undergrazing. We usually have an overgrazing and an expansion of thornbush because of undergrazing. And again, with the increase of thornbush, the increase of tsetse flies. So yeah, so there's an actual conservation reason to protect buffaloes, not beyond the fact that we just feel whimsical about the big five. Their absence is, is hurting humanity. 
and hurting a lot of domestic animals as well. Any other questions before I carry on? I'm trying really hard to slow down my classes because people say, Nick, you talk really quickly. So I'm constantly asking for questions, making sure I don't jump any topics and uh, making sure you guys are getting all, everything you want to know about. No, I think, no questions. Oh, Anton, yes, question. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Sorry, I got a question from Anton. Uh, a, a buffalo. Uh, let me just put Anton's uh, microphone. Um, put on the chat, uh, the, the Red Flag Game Reserve also in Pretoria has the TB free buffaloes. Yeah. So Reflay, yeah, Reflay's got a very, I've read about that. Um, yeah. There's a couple reserves of TB free buffaloes. The problem is, of course, is breeding them and keeping them separate from, from, from TB infected buffaloes. Um, and um, the problem is with a lot of those reserves, because they're so, uh, they're so expensive, the security measures around the buffalo and the maintaining those buffaloes so high, so they do everything to maintain them. And they get actually, they have lower breeding success rates because they are kept almost in captivity. They domesticate fairly okay, but um, they, they actually have lower breeding rates in captivity than they do in, in the wild. So by having in these small little reserves, uh, almost in pens, I've actually seen buffaloes in breeding pens like cattle. It's pretty impressive, uh, but they actually breed at a lower rate. So it, it's, it's, it's a very difficult contribution to conservation because they're not really keeping up with the TB buffalo. They're, they're, they're falling behind, you know? So um, we need, a, and I'm not a vet, I'm not a, uh, any sort of scientist, so, but we need to devise more effective ways of introducing buffaloes into areas where they historically have disappeared or they've got lower numbers and at the same time, finding a way to deal with TB infections. Um, sorry, who was asking a question last before you? Hello? Anybody? There was a question. It's gone. Yeah, uh, Buffalo Territorial. Yeah, um, no, not really, no. Um, you might find a, a male has a den, but not territorial as in he actually patrols like a, like, a, like a rhino. He doesn't mark his territory. Buffaloes don't mark territory. None, neither do any really... Um, They'll have a, a scratching post. They might mark with pre water glands, but they're not really going to actively patrol and actively defend. They might they will choose an area they just like to live in, and they might tolerate other males hanging in that area. They might not tolerate other males hanging in that area. It's just a preferred habitat, but it's not a true territory, if you know what I mean. Demarcated, marked out with dung droppings and urine droppings, and said, "This is my zone." They just splatter as they walk. And, and dribble urine as they walk. So it's not real territory. You often see buffaloes rubbing their boss on trees. And a lot of guys say that's actually marking territory. A lot of the time it's just sharpening the boss, getting rid of parasites, relieving an itch. And sometimes it does leave a bit of a scent, but it's more of an ind indicator rather than an actual territorial marking. They don't really mark territories. Okay. If that answers that question. Um, got another chat question coming through here. Uh, Linda has a question. Linda, Linda, Linda. Oh, I just uh, asked territorial. Oh, so you, Linda. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Frankie, no questions. Okay, sorry. Oh, it doesn't say your name above you. I just okay. Oh, there it says in the corner, Linda. My bad, geez. Okay, so anyway, so the the the, the decrease in buffalo is a major factor uh, for the spread of tsetse flies. Also, buffaloes, and this sounds really counterintuitive, are important for tick dispersal, and you might say. What the hell do we need ticks for? Ticks are incredibly important for controlling populations of sick animals. They wipe out sick animals out of gene pools. Buffaloes disperse them in the hundreds of thousands into areas, especially after a fire. You have, a, you have huge herds of buffaloes infested with ticks coming into an area and actually redistributing tick populations. And they are an incredible part of ecology and conservation. Ticks are important. They have a role. They're food for numerous animals, not only ox peckers. You find a lot of, um, you find a lot of small mammals rely on ticks. Uh, you'll find that they are themselves. They also prey for a lot of different types of insects. And um, tick populations are maintained partly through buffalo, buffaloes moving through areas. And have you ever noticed how you don't really get ticks in areas with a lot of um, with a lot of ruminants? Ruminants carry a lot of ticks, and they are important for dispersal. If you ever take your, you go for a walk in a reserve with their very few animals, you don't find many ticks. And again, you'll find there's a shortage in other areas. Um, 
So those reintrodu reintroductions of tick populations are important. Also, um, and again, those tick populations, they themselves help control sick animals and other types of populations of animals. Um, now, now that sounds a bit ridiculous. People say, oh my God, ticks are gross. But anyway, that is an ecological aspect. Another thing is for seed introduction of plants. What happens in Africa, we tend to have um, boom and bust feeding, pa feeding patterns where there's this massive boom of vegetation. A lot of animals move into that area. And this is what happens in the wilderness, not on farmlands and and on safe little nature reserves, but in proper true wilderness, you have areas that are that have a boom in terms of vegetation one season, lots of animals move into that area, strip it dry, and that soil becomes hard and compacted. Now, that very, has a very difficult time, firstly, recolonizing a year later, um, because that soil is compacted and hard. And also on top of that, um, you'll find that the, the animal eventually it just gets drier and drier and drier and leads to water runoff because it becomes like a concrete. So you get flooding in the area and it has a whole bunch of ecological effects. When you have buffalo, which have tend to have, unlike elephants and rhinos, uh, which have very soft feet, buffalo have got hooves, cattle, and they're really hard and they're abrasive and they crack and they kick into things and they do a lot of damage. I mean, you can follow buffalo through you know, along a, a parking lot because he makes a mark. Buffalo are incredibly easy to track. Um, you can get lost in a herd in their general direction, but, the, you know, you can find buffalo tracks in the longest of grass. They leave tracks very easily. And that's because of virtue of those hooves. And when you have large populations of buffalo smashing through, the, through areas, trampling on hard, compacted dirt, it loosens up that, do that dirt. It allows for, that, the, for, for, for uh, water to permeate into that soil and also allows for seeds to find purchase in the cracks that have been introduced by the buffalo. Rather than this hard runoff surface, those cracked, broken up surfaces, all those little scat marks and those little scallop marks in the soil, that's ideal for seed catchment. And when you introduce it in the tens of thousands of footprints, you help reinvigorating grasslands. So animals like buffalo and zebra actually are very important. Animals with hard hooves are very important for grassland introduction and grassland maintenance. And that's often ignored. It helps with cattle, with true cattle, as in the ones we eat. The problem is, is they don't bunch together the same way a buffalo do. Cattle tend to spread out and they're also quite light. A cow is often not more than 450 kilograms. A buffalo is double that. So you've got a much heavier animal moving through in tight, compacted groups in large numbers. And it's almost like a bulldozer tearing up, a TLB, tearing up the landscape and helping reinvigorate soils. And they've compared reserves with low buff buffalo populations, with high buffalo populations. And high buffalo populations have been indicative of healthier grasslands. And we can emulate that with cattle, but Quite frankly, I'm saying, why are we not just farming buffalo instead? You know, we've got more cattle in Africa than buffalo. They require the same ecological conditions, and buffalo would be far more beneficial to the environment. And quite frankly, it tastes the same as beef, in my opinion. Um, other questions? Yeah. Okay. Nothing. No other questions yet. Moving on. Um, now. Okay. Anton. Other question. I love questions. Anton, yes. Listen, what's the main difference between the African buffalo and the Asian buffalo? The African buffalo, firstly, is significantly more robustly built. He is heavy. An Asian buffalo barely tops 600, a really big one. An African buffalo, 900. So you've got 300 kilograms of muscle. They're comparably the same size. Bear in mind that the buffalo's got nothing on the Indian guar. The Indian guar is 1,200 kilograms. Top that. Okay, but the, but the guar, there's only a few thousand guar left in the world. They're very rare, G-U-A-R. But the African buffalo is 900 kilograms. And he um, is a large animal. He has a larger head. You'll find that the Asian buffalo has got a slightly more elongated face and longer straight horns without that big boss in the middle. So he tends to have just a, he uh, a cap that's, that's, that's a furry, which is often brown. Even the males or females are brown. It has long, long straight hooves. He doesn't have those really thick, robust boss that you know all the trophy hunters love. So they're not as adapted to 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 uh, fighting as African buffalo are, and that's also owing to the habitat. Asian buffaloes tend to wallow in water, neck, you know, nose deep in deep water, so they will stand in water just like a uh, just like a hippo does. 
right up to the nose and they'll sit in water emulating almost hippo behavior so they don't want to have a heavy head structure on them and they also don't want to be as heavy as a buffalo because wallowing deep 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 in water up to their nose you know standing is not conducive when you're heavyweight so they are lighter and i find also that asian buffaloes in my experience i've been charged by both species i found asian buffalo females to be more aggressive I find African buffalo males to the, the males to be more aggressive. So, as with Asians, the females are always more dangerous. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's really they're quite easy to tell apart. Um, what you also find on the Asian buffaloes, the knees to the hooves are a caramel brown colored, whereas African buffaloes they tend to be black, black gray. Um, Asian buffaloes also have less fur on the body; they're almost completely bald, whereas African buffaloes have significantly more here in fact with some it's they're fully coated um i got a bit distracted where was i before that question um yeah um now one of the big things of course is with um like any industry is the absence of dominant males now dominant males have been extirpated through the trophy hunting industry um they are they are untouched by predators because they're just too big and too strong but the trophy industry has eradicated all those big 900 950 males in southern africa when i say southern africa i'm talking southern zimbabwe um, namibia botswana south africa we've been shooting all these big males for trophies so of course the breeding males are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and if you compare the size of a south african buffalo with an east african buffalo they're the same species sorry the same subspecies as the southern african buffalo they are just significantly smaller in fact often you're hard pressed to find a south african buffalo of a 750 kilograms um, and the bosses themselves are significantly smaller so that head, that whole um, horn structure is much smaller than our guys because every generation hunters head out and shoot the guys with the biggest horns. So the only ones left in the gene pool are individuals with smaller horns and they're the ones doing the breeding. I'm sure you read recently uh, on Facebook on the news how uh, African elephants are evolving without tusks. I'm sure everyone's seen that. It's been in Getaway Magazine, it's been on National Geographic, it's been everywhere. And that is also not because of the trophy hunting industry, but because of the poaching industry. The only elephants left behind from poaching um, are the ones that have smaller tusks. And with every generation, the tusks get smaller and smaller and smaller because they're the only ones left behind to breed. Um, so Linda, I'm just going to put your microphone off for you. Uh, if that's OK. Yeah, sorry, just because people's, um, people are lagging. Um, so the situation with 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 the, the 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 sport hunting industry is that it's putting pressure genetic pressure on all of our predators or no sorry on all of our animal predators on all of our large animals okay and um it's 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 a biological bottlenecking because we're removing the big healthy breeders out of populations for sport now those animals wouldn't be taken out in the wild because they're the dominant biggest strongest males they're just not going to get hit by lions. Lions are going to go for the weak buffalo. We're doing the opposite. We're leaving the weak buffalo and we're shooting the good ones. So we're destroying the gene pools. And we really need to reevaluate the way that we handle this. And again, I know I sound like a hippie. I don't care. I eat meat, um, but I just believe in eating ethical meat and not killing things for fun. Um, so, but um, that is one of the big problems of buffalo. If you go out, I mean, I walked on Mount Kenya, I'd seen the biggest buffalo of my life. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was a ton. It, it was cartoonishly big. I mean, the, the body was gargantuan. And, um, and you just don't see buffalo that big in South Africa. In fact, I'm very rarely been that impressed with South African buffalo. The largest herds I've ever seen in South Africa are Pongola Game Reserve. I've picked herds of up to 150 individuals. And there have been some nice specimens in that population. Um, bear in mind that they're not allowed to move out of Pongola Game Reserve. So there's a bit of a genetic... genetic um, inbreeding situation happening there as well but those populations if you ever visit pongola game reserve you'll be surprised how few alien invasives there actually are and that's because the actual buffalo there are actually helping maintain the grasses there so you're not getting that many invasive species like chromalina and those sorts of things invading those areas because the buffalo populations there which are fairly large um, are actually helping maintain a fairly healthy ecosystem and they also maintain the 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 the, the absence of thornbush they are always thickets of thornbush which are important you just don't want these thousand kilometer stretches of them you know um 
we've only got 10 minutes left guys uh do we have any questions before i keep adding to my story <laughs> nothing okay yeah so um buffalo are as nearly uh, are definitely as aggressive as people say they are they the reputation precedes them they are not there's no mythology about them. They are definitely one of the most aggressive animals in Africa. And of the big five, they probably account for the highest number of injuries. They're not the highest number of injuries out of all animals. I'd probably say crocodile first place, hippo second place, buffalo third place. If you're looking at large animal attacks, uh, crocodiles hunt humans. We're food. You know, four and a half meter crocodile is going to eat me like I'm candy. A hippo is a cranky bastard. And if I go down to the water to wash, wash my clothing, chances are I'm going to get hit by a hippo. Um, and on top of that, I'm also, if I'm walking around at night, hippos are going to be nocturnal and they're going to be out. Strangely enough, uh, buffaloes also tend to be, tend to be more nocturnal. And that's partly because they have a hard time uh, maintaining their body temperature. They just have a hard time doing it. So they often wallow in mud to help cool themselves down. They don't dust path like elephants or rhinos. They actually cake themselves in mud to keep themselves cool during the day and they tend to do more activity during the night and that's because they have a harder time maintaining their body temperature so you often you'll be walking around in the bush at night coming back from your village and there'll be either a hippo or a buffalo lingering around in the dark and you tend to end up getting killed by one of these two individuals so um it's often just being at the wrong place at the wrong time and they don't actively stalk you like some people say people say oh that buffalo followed me for five kilometers a buffalo is like a landmine he just sits in the long grass hanging out doing his thing minding his business you walk through that long grass and next thing you know you're two meters away from a buffalo and then he hammers you and you're dead or you have a broken hip um i knew a guide from salati game reserve uh, in 2004 when i was up there and he had been hit by a buffalo um about 10 years early in the 90s he was showing me the scar on his side and um he was telling me about he got hit by a buffalo and it broke his hip and he had to walk back with his rifle, apparently 10 kilometers back to camp. I mean, he was out doing a patrol on his own. And um, God knows why. But anyway, he showed me the scar. So I do know it was real. He had to have massive construction, reconstructive surgery on the side. And this buffalo hammered him hard. But it didn't kill him. So they don't always kill us. You know, People say, oh, they'll come back and finish the job. This animal just charged them, ran them through, and ran off. And that often happens. There's this reputation that they come back to finish the job. And no, they don't. They're not malicious. They're just very skittish and very mercurial. And they tend to charge on instinct. And they follow through the charge, but often they just get the hell out of there. Sometimes they'll try to finish the job because they get into that bloodlust, you know, that frenetic mindset. But it's not out of any maliciousness. It's just they're in this war zone mode. And they're just hammering something they see as a threat to them. Buffalo um, also... You know, compared to a lot of other browsers, also a lot of the grazers, they're very aggressive and very protective. They will usually fight off predators if they can get the chance, okay? But on their own, they'll often run away. And that's really the only time that buffalo get hammered um, is solitary males. Females almost never get hit uh, unless they're crossing rivers or they get isolated because they're often in a big herd. But it's the males that get hit. When I say males, I'm talking about the younger males. I mean, those groups of two to three males between the ages of two and five years, they're not quite as big. Um, and they often get hit by, by, by male lions because male lions will form coalitions and they will attack buffaloes and bring them down. And those buffaloes, because there's such an inordinate amount of meat, they provide this buffet for so many other animals. And that is the, that is the importance of having dead animals in your environment. And um, you know they provide food for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time for, for lots of predators, and not just lions and leopards and hyenas, for mongooses and weasels and you know jackals and all these other animals rely on that big animal. So having a big dead animal around is actually a good thing. So when you I've worked at reserves where I've heard about guys saying, no, we don't want to have coalitions of males because they hunt our buffaloes. And actually, in one reserve I worked at, they shot two males, which is why I don't work there anymore. Um, because they said, uh, oh, no, we don't want the males hunting the buffaloes. We like our population of buffaloes looking pretty. But having dead buffaloes every couple of weeks or every couple of months is a blessing to a reserve. You are literally feeding mass populations of animals, feeding birds, you're feeding reptiles, you're feeding monitor lizards, you're feeding jackals, hyenas. It is important. So this mindset where we don't want lions to kill our buffaloes, even though the populations are declining, is nonsense. We should encourage lions to hunt buffaloes and as long as we're not hunting them ourselves their populations actually maintain themselves 
But a lot of reserves use buffalo as a bread and butter for hunting uh, because they can charge a lot of money. And um, it's a thrill, you know, to hunt a buffalo from 100 meters away from behind a trench, you know. Um, and uh, so these buffaloes, unfortunately, they get hammered by human hunters. And that's really the only reason why the populations decline and why reserves are often apprehensive to let lions hunt buffalo. It's only the big national parks where you'll see reserves tolerating lions hunting buffalo. And many reserves, if they see their males hunting buffalo, they'll usually take out one or two of the male lions to stop them doing that. And I personally think on an ethical side, it's wrong. And on an ecological side, it's wrong. You need to have dead, large carcasses interspersed amongst your reserves as for a variety of reasons. They provide food to so many different animals. And um, something like an impala or an yala is just not going to cut it. You know, you're not going to feed 40, 40 um vultures of one impala you know you need to have a large heavy carcass lying around uh what is the uh, buffalo horns is it made of keratin yes so it's exactly the same as as hair imagine as bound hair around bone so imagine if you want and it's the same as a rhino's horn it's not the same as a tusk of an elephant which is ivory it's teeth so a rhino's horn is made out of keratin which is literally just hair bound and fused together it's like scale and it's wrapped around the bones. The bone grows out and the keratin grows over it. And that's the same for all horns. Unlike antlers, which is literally just a bony substance that grows in layers and branches out. And antlers are shed annually, annually whereas horns are permanent. So if a buffalo breaks his horn, tough. He's broken his horn, it's not growing back. Um, it'll just form a stump. And I've actually seen buffalo, I'm pretty sure anyone that's worked in the bush more than six months in their life or seen at least one buffalo with a stump and one horn it, it often happens especially with older bulls by the time you're getting to 12 years old you've been in a thousand fights you crack those horns a thousand times and eventually they're going to fall off or one is going to break off we've got time for like two more questions guys um any more questions um, um yeah. yeah yes what what ecological role do buffalo play in the ecosystem well, as I said, firstly, the grassland introduction, uh, grassland maintenance by breaking up hard concrete, when I say concrete, I mean baked surfaces like sand, clay, clay surfaces that are baked, they break that up because they are heavy and they have sharp hooves, unlike elephants and uh, rhinos and giraffes. And they also, they come in large numbers, tightly bound and act like a bulldozer, tearing up the soil. They disperse parasites, which is important. Parasites are important in ecology. They, when they get killed by lions, um, they are a food source for numerous small predators. And um, on top of that, um, they also help maintain bushy growth because when they move through bushy areas, they, there's large numbers of buffaloes break open that bush and allow for the penetration of smaller animals, which means animals feed through a larger canopy of trees rather than just on the outskirts of trees. If you ever look at a sickle bush thicket, you'll see it only gets browsed on the outside. But when large animals break through the sickle bush thicket, they make it accessible completely through that network. Allowing for Inyala, Kudu, Bushbuck, whatever, Impala to come through and browse. We've got like 30 seconds left, guys. Um, anyway, yeah, Buffalo, I've never really noticed them using one horn more than the other, but probably uh, there hasn't really been much study done into it. I can't tell you for sure. We're running out of time. We've got like 10 seconds left. I don't know why it's running so early. It says it's got one minute. Um, but yeah, thanks guys. Um, really appreciate it. We'll continue with buffaloes next week if you're interested. Otherwise, we'll move on to lions, one of my personal favorites, uh, which is a lot more comprehensive and there's a lot to talk about. But hopefully this has been informative about the value of buffaloes, far more than just being a big scary cow. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, WhatsApp me. Uh, 